this is a, another map, and each of these X's represent coal mines. And this is the scene. It's labeled as PW, which is the Whitwell Shale. The Whitwell Shale, I have a sample at the back of the room, is surrounds the coal seam. So we have shale above it and shale below it. And the shale represents a significant problem. I'll get into that more later. The PW is also marked on this side of the road. And we'll talk more about that, but there's reports that mining was actually extended all the way up to the W road. So we may have cavities in this entire area that have not been completely characterized. Next slide. Again, these are the, this is the Lyons property. We located an air shaft here. We have a, an open mine here that's weeping acid right now. And that's been measured by TDAC at a pH of three. The air shaft that was closed up sits above it. And I have put up a video on, on uh, Facebook that showed the excavation process. Now, let me go back to the 1990 reclamation. When they came to my property, they came in with a huge excavators to do the mine work. The, one of the excavators actually fell into one of the mines and it took them three days with three more pieces of equipment to get that piece of equipment out of the ground. So these are not small cavities. And we've had reports of, of substances, sinkholes, that have actually damaged homes. In fact, we have an event on Battle, Park, or on Battle Street off of Lewis Mine, I'm sorry, off of Timesville, where the, a cavity suddenly opened up next to the road, and TDAC had to come out and pack it and close it because it completely blocked the road. And I'll get into more information about that later. Um, next slide. So, the summary of the 63 report, and I have the document here, all I've done is copy the section out of the document. Table 3 shows a total of 14 million tons of estimated reserves of recoverable coal. Recoverable coal is coal they think they can mine. There's still another 50% that they cannot mine. And so we're looking at 28 million tons of coal still sitting underneath the mountain. The reserves are considered only coal beds of more than 28 inches. Anything smaller than that, they won't mine, but it still burns. That's where the problem lies. Sufficient reserves of coal of minimum thickness and good enough quality for steam and domestic are known on the Fairmont finding to support the coal industry, many times larger than the present one for many years. Reserves in the seams are located over a wide area so that many sites are available for medium-sized mines. What does that translate into? We have exposures all over the mountain of coal that in certain circumstances would ignite. Next slide. Here are the numbers that they proposed, and there are actually three coal seams in this area. The Richland, which is uh, available all over the mountain, the Sewanee, which is the one that's a major concern because it's the major coal seam at 20 million, or 10 million tons, and the Lantana, which is very minimal, for a total of 14 million. Taught twice that, 28 million tons of coal. If we were to burn 1,000 tons a day, that represents 77 years of a coal fire. Now, you say, well, that seems real extreme. Uh, you know, why, why would you even claim that? Next slide. These are the list of 62 mines in the 62 or in the 63 report. 62 mines. That represents 62 places where someone could light a fire and start a problem. Well, most of these are located anecdotally through uh, coordinates that are not related to GPS. So I'm still working on trying to get the coordinates for a lot of these locations so that. When TDAC comes out, we can actually go look at locations where we would have concerns. You'll recognize some familiar places. Roberts Mine is Robertsville Road. And guess what? Uh, the Flipper Bend development on Robertsville Road is over a coal seam. In fact, there's exposed coal that TDAC has looked at 
and identify. I didn't see the bottom of the development. Also on Roberts Mill Road, two months ago, we had a fuel spill. And later you'll understand why that's a concern, because if the fuel spill gets into the coal scene, a new situation appears. Uh, the Richard Lewis and uh, his brother Grover Lewis are who my road is named after, Lewis Mine. And in that area, as I showed you, we have six mines pointed at my home alone. In fact, above my driveway, I have a sinkhole that is now getting deeper and deeper, and TDEC is supposed to come out and try to fill that. It's an active geological area, very active. Next slide. So, um, let's get back to the 63 survey. They conducted that survey by going to miners and asking where they mine and how much they mine. It's anecdotal. We have no clear maps of these mines. And so every time someone's going to do development, there's really no sound information for them to go to to know what they're working over. And that's one of the issues that we have with the Anderson proposal is they won't even admit to the presence of coal. So we have a real issue with where they are and where we are in our knowledge of the situation. Um, and with local discussions, and I don't know if any of you know Ricky Meeks, I'm gonna call him out. Ricky's come to my property and worked on equipment while we've talked about his experience in the coal mine. When he was a seven year old, he got snake bit on Timesville Road because his father was digging coal and didn't keep him out of the camp area that they were working in. Ricky has told me that he knows that they mine this area all the way out to the brow. And yet, the, none of the maps indicate any of that process going on. Next slide. Okay, this is what the, coal, uh, what the Suwannee coal scene is about. It's found in the middle of different part of the Whitwell Shale. This is the shale that we're talking about. I have that chunk sitting at the back of the room. This is a porous, layered uh, conglomerate that has iron deposits in it, like hematite, like um, pyrite, and these deposits lead to a fracturing of this material. And weather, water, freeze-thaw fragments this stuff into a powder, and then it collapses. So our concerns with this configuration is that we're having this constant erosion of uh, shale while we still have coal sitting in the seam, plus we have the gases that are present there to this day. Back at the table, there are samples of coal that I can pick up off the ground on my property anytime. Handfuls of coal that are still on the surface of the ground. And this is 60 years after the mines were supposedly closed. So we have a discrepancy between saying that we have no coal and that we have coal still sitting on the surface of the ground. This is what results from the sandstone. When it begins to fail, it turns into sand. And at the surface of the mountain, we have what's called indurated sandstone. It's been hardened by weather, and, and it provides a crust. But underneath that, let me have the next slide. Yep, let me go back here. I hope you can see this. This is a sinkhole. And the visibility of it is obviously very poor. I hope you can see that. So, uh, no, yeah. Let me have the signal. And, and what I will tell you, and we've got somebody here with kids, the reason I got involved in the mine reclamation program was in 1990, I had a seven and nine year old who as soon as we moved in, they went out to look at the mines and came back to me and said, hey dad, look what we found. Imagine my shock when I saw a 10-foot hole that they luckily hadn't gotten into. And everyone with children in this audience and on the mountain should understand that these are still present. They're still hazardous. And if you know, if you think you have something like this near you, you need to let me know or let TDAC know because that's what they're interested in and that's what they're closing up. Next slide. This, I don't know if you can make it out, this is an actual mine opening. And what you see above 
is the collapse from the upper soils, the overburden. The mine is still behind it, and at the base of this is where we're weeping acid. So what does this acid do to us? Next slide. I'm sorry. This is an area of my property that was reclaimed, but still will not grow plants because of the acid has degraded the soils to such a degree that nothing grows in it. We'll get little stuff coming up for a year. It dies the next year. Next slide. So acid runoff, pH of 2.5 to 3. Wild acid never stops as long as the seam is there. Mines are going to continue to do this process. And <coughs> this is a problem that we can remediate. Uh, the iron sulfides follow the streams. Kills most of the aquatic life in the stream. Damages soils. Combined with the septic, septic runoff, forms a really foul slime. And I don't know if you folks ever hike these places, but you'll come across creeks that are blood red and they're greasy. And this is a combination of acid, mine acid, and, and runoff from our poor septic systems. Next slide. The remediation I've done, this is what's left of the effluent as it's coming out of the mine. And all the plant material that you see here treats it. So you can go in and you can do work to correct these situations with the mine acid, but it's going to be an ongoing problem and damages the environment constantly. This is what it looks like when it's not treated. This is off that mountain on, in Bledsoe. And Bledsoe also has mining activity. <clears throat> this was part of a uh, 19, tw uh, 2012 um, reclamation process, but this is also the site where they had a coal mine explosion in 62 that killed 17 men. That's how close some of these issues are and how we really need to pay attention to those kinds of problems. This is a LIDAR, and maybe folks can see it now. This is a laser scan of this, of the top of the mountain. My property, my property sits here, and the LOP property is right here. These gradations represent elevation changes. And the LIDAR is uh, accurate enough to actually spot line of things. This is my driveway. This is the road that they created to do the reclamation process. I apologize if that's not very clear. Uh, I have copies of all these things available if anybody would like to see that. Andy, could you just go into that? I know you just go into that a little bit more detail now. What is that line? What are we really seeing there? Laser, uh, a laser scan is sort of like radar, where they're bouncing a laser beam off the ground and it's returning to a detector. And as they go over the ground, this information is integrated to a process called Fourier transform to develop a picture. It does not really see, these are buildings. This is all Timesville right here. Okay, and these are the buildings. Uh, down in here, you can see the roads. Let me have the next slide. And I blew it up here. Um, and this is the driveway. This is the road that TDEC, or that the federal government created to, to, to do this reclamation. And right here, you see these two dots. Those are sinkholes. Right above my driveway. That's my driveway. There are the sinkholes, and this is my home. So this is an active process, and there are ways to detect these things, but this, this technology does not look underneath the ground. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Next slide. So the TDAC mission, abandoned mines pose serious threats to public health, safety, and welfare, as well as degrade the environment. This is TDAC statement, okay? We have the reclamation program and understand, this is an after process. They're reclaiming something. They're not preventing anything. And you need to understand that clearly. So they improve dangerous health and safety hazards, improve the environment, and restore resources to make them available for development creation and other uses. Once you understand what reclamation does, you want to know what the bounds of what this statement is about. Next slide. Now, things that we don't control. We can't control the rainfall. 
We can't control the quantity, we can't control the intensity, and we can't control the frequency. Those are all critical issues to the degradation process that our sandstone mountain is going through and will continue to go through time of memorial, geological events, slides. We can't, like what happened down at the bottom of the mountain, that slide when we had the front of the mountain fall off. We can't do anything about that. That's the degradation that we can't control. Uh, lightning. Why is lightning an issue? Well, I have a tree on my property that's over a coal seam. It's dead, but if lightning were to strike it, it would light the coal up as it burned. Wildfires, something we can't control, but if they strike near a coal seam, they represent a significant hazard. Human events. This is the big booger because we have got so many things that we have no control over. I just had a group of children on uh, my neighbor's property three weeks ago start a fire for fun on top of the coal seam. We called, w we called emergency. WRS was out there immediately. They put the fire out. There was no hazard, but it's not the thing that you can predict. And, and I've got a place on the back of Mr. Smith's property where there's been a campfire set up for years. They never lit anything up, but that's the kind of event that could trigger this. Next slide. This is my creek. You go back, let it run. This is my creek in uh, June or May, uh, April of 17. And as you look up, that's what's coming down the creek. This was a three inch rain. Next slide. This is what it looks like most of the time. It's a dry creek. So the top of the watershed dumps tremendous amounts of water. And every time we go in there and we grade something, we create a new impervious surface like a parking lot, we put in a building, this flow will increase dramatically. And I've got neighbors who've already been flooded out to three feet in their homes, and this is on top of a mountain, okay? Can you go back to the light arm? One more. And what you're seeing here is, this is a, a valley now. We have a surface, an almost level surface. The Timesville Church, the, the Colossus property that somebody owns there, those properties have been flooded up to three and four feet in rains that are occurring on a mountain. So we face significant water management issues, and that also plays into the mines, because as these water issues become increasingly uh, exacerbated. They erode the mine structures. They erode the, the shale. That creates collapses and, and putting a building on top of a mine with a gas station that if they have a fuel spill is going to go into one of these cavities creates a catastrophic event. Go ahead. Let's go. One more. One more. Keep going. So here's, here's a crude drawing of what we're looking at. This is the hardened surface. Underneath that we have a sandstone mixture, hard and soft. Um, underneath that is the shale sand layer. Here's the coal layer with voids in it underneath the, sh the shale sand layer. And these are the, the two other seams. As they begin, next slide. When they grind off the top to produce a parking lot, they're going to fracture all of the sandstone. And as traffic and more traffic comes up the mountain, there's also going to be fracturing to the sandstone. It doesn't represent a good statement. It's not granite. Okay? And so these other seams can also be lit up because the coal seam fire tends to go along the seam and find ways to get to more source. Next slide. So, coal seam fires. This one has me going a little nuts. Coal seam fires occur in operating coal mines, abandoned coal mines, and waste coal ponds. Sometimes they start by a nearby blaze, but they can also be ignited through spontaneous combustion, and that's a mineral issue. 
and certain minerals in the coal, like sulfites and pyrites, can start the process burning. Coal fire hazards to health and environment include toxic fumes, reigniting fires, sinkholes, and then whether they're started by natural causes or humans, coal seam fires continue to burn for decades. And, uh, and they cannot be put out by groundwater, and they cannot be put out by rain. According to a 210 article, there are 112 coal seam fires in the United States right now. They cannot be put out. Once they start, you don't get them out. And that's where the concern is. And I'm listing the source for that, those quotes there, that story. So, uh, causes. The Carbondale fire is up north, and it was started in a trash dump by the Little Strip Line in 1940. It's still burning. Uh, these are all other coal seam fires. They don't know how they started, but they're burning. In Centralia, which is the most famous, Centralia, Pennsylvania, that coal seam fire started in 1962 because the mayor sent the fire department out to burn a rubbish pile. Simple, simple problem. Turned out that now Centralia is completely gone. They, the government had to buy everybody out. Buildings were collapsing. It's just not usable. Three more towns in the area are now fighting coal seam fires. Pennsylvania, wonderful coal, but a real hazard. There are 21 citations in this one of coal seam fires that they can't identify. Their sources were, were made by human intervention. Next slide. Toxic fumes. Before a fire, the mine contains carbon monoxide, hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, methane, nitrogen, nitrogen peroxide, I think it's dioxide, oxygen, and sulfur dioxide. All of these are toxic to some degree. Next slide. After the, during the fire, though, you're getting carbon monoxide, CO2, sulfuric acid, hydrogen sulfide, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, benzene, and other volatile organic compounds. These are fire-causing materials. They are toxic to the human body, and they're uh, abound in abundance in a coal seam fire. Next slide. Triggers, open burning over a coal seam, campfires that get out of control, house fires on a coal seam, fuel spills from storage tanks or refueling, industrial and construction accidents involving ignition sources, forest fires, grass fires, lightning strikes, spontaneous combustion. All of these are recorded events. Um, these are more Colorado's dealing with it, West Virginia's dealing with it, Ohio's dealing with it, Kentucky's dealing with it, Wyoming's dealing with it. Anywhere you have coal, you're going to get a possibility of coal seam fire, and they really don't seem to have much luck uh, preventing them once they've started the coal mining process. So, the cycle of development. More homes, more services. More services, more demand. More demand, more homes. When more population produces more traffic, more hazard events, less quality of life, and a possible loss of our mountain. If a fire were to start in our coal seam, Within years, everyone would be driven off the mountain because the air quality would go down horribly and we would have no way of putting it out. Um, next slide. Now, we went to the Planning Commission with this information. Their response was, the staff was informed by concerned citizens that the area has been lines and mine shafts. This information was forwarded to the Tennessee Department of Conservation, TDAC. Listen to that. This information was, should be provided to TDAP. Any safety hazards related to this issue would be addressed through land disturbing and permitting processes. Zoning does not regulate mitigation of site-related mine safety hazards. Why doesn't zoning address health and human safety? That statement makes no sense whatsoever. Provide for health and safety and the welfare of the community is the first charge of the Planning Commission. And yet they ignored this, this information and said, well, you've got to go talk to TDAC when TDAC provided the information. So we're involved in a hot potato. TDAC, now, next slide. TDAC, from my TDAC I get, there are no regulations covering coal seam hazards. No regulations. 
and there is nothing about the selenic holocene that would prevent it from catching on fire. That's from the state engineer. So, with those two statements, we're placed in a position of really trying to defend our community from what they're proposing. Next slide. And as a scientist, I believe in verification. I'm making a lot of claims here based on some documents which I've had to accept from somebody else. There are techniques where we can resolve this information. Reflection seismology is used by the oil and gas industry and by the coal industry to identify mineral resources. It will also identify mine openings and mine shafts. Vertical seismo uh, seismic profiling is another technique that's used to characterize the kind of structure that we're actually dealing with. Finally, ground penetrating radar is another piece of science that they can apply to this that would really answer a lot of these questions. So, what can we do? Educate ourselves and our community about these issues. Tell your story to anybody to get a complete picture of the mountain. And what I've been going around, I've been talking to the older people in the community, having them give me their stories, and we need to compare those to what TDEC is telling us, because there are important discrepancies in those two things. The Magnet Environmental Ecological Study that clearly and definitively describes the coal seam hazard, structural stability of the development areas, taking into account stormwater control, sewage, acid drainage, and substance uh, uh, collapses. Get WRS and single out fire department information and training to deal with this hazard. The firemen are clued into this. They, they knew what they were involved in when they came to visit my home, but I think that there's still a place to train them as to where these hazards actually lie so that they're prepared if something like this were to happen. Be involved in building, zoning, permitting issues anywhere on the plateau. Allow variances only in extreme need. Uphold the current ordinances. Uphold the Stormwater Control Act. The Stormwater Control Act was enacted in 2001. It requires that these developments control their stormwater and that was one of the things that stopped the rains proposal. They couldn't create a structure that was actually going to control stormwater, and they couldn't get onto the sewage system. Anderson's going to face the same problem. He's proposing things that he doesn't have the room to do and are not going to effectively meet the needs of uh, the, the mountain community. It requires significant insurance bonds of developers working in danger areas. Demand governments, Walden, Hamilton County, Sapache County, and the state create protections for this hazard and not just remediation. It does us no good if they come in and fix them when we could have prevented it. Um, revise the plateau plan to reflect the environmental problem that we have up here. The plateau plan doesn't say a word about coal. Neither does the Walden zoning issue. There are no regulations about coal seam hazards. Demand infrastructure before development. Make sure that they've got the, place, the pieces in place that are, going to make, that are going to prevent these hazards from occurring. And we've heard nothing about infrastructure from Walden, from Single Mountain, or from the county. Now, I happen to know that TDOT actually hired a company from Colorado to come out and lecture them on recovering from coal mine fires. They did that in 2012. Public wasn't invited, but the company Zapata is fighting fires in Colorado, coal seam fires, and they were getting advice on what do we do, how do we do it. Next slide. What happens on the highway doesn't stay on the highway. What happens on Lewis Mine doesn't stay on Lewis Mine, and what happens in LOP is not going to stay in LOP. Remember that. Their efforts are going to affect everybody on the mountain, and unless you appreciate that, we're going to be struggling with developers coming in and wanting to do more construction, more disturbances, and putting things over places they should never be. As an example, Fox Run. That whole community is over a coal mine scene. Um, St. Uh, St. Ives, they, their homes are in a coal mine scene. We've got places where if a fire starts, people are going to have to run for their lives, and we need to appreciate that. Last slide. 28 million tons. 
That's an ugly, ugly number. And it keeps me up at night. But it's something that if we work as a community together and understand the hazard, things can continue to grow. I'm not saying, no, don't let anybody else on the mountain. No, never put up another building. I'm saying that if you're going to do that, do it in a way that's responsible to the environment and to the rest of the community. Don't let the pie in the sky hide the coal in the hole. <laughs> I'm serious about that. Everybody needs to think about that issue because they're going to come back and say, oh, we're going to give you these wonderful things, great groceries, great shopping, community center. But what are we going to sacrifice if something goes wrong? And the more you do, the more chances you have of something going wrong. Thank you.